So it's great to be here. Um, Michelle, I was trying to actually remember when we met first. I think it was when you were in WWF. Yeah. Struggling yeah. with things in WWF. The Biodiversity uh, Convention in Geneva. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I know it's wonderful to be here with you and with everybody else. Um, what I'll do is uh, maybe take about 40, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, this is let's you know make this interactive. So if there's stuff anybody wants to ask or comment on or contradict me, then during the presentation, I think that's also fine. Um, normally, what I do uh, when I do this presentation is uh, like half the bad news and half the good news. The deconstructing of current reality, which you mentioned, and then what's reconstructive. But I'm going to keep the first half actually quite brief. Because I think everybody here is very familiar with the problems with the current models of development and governance and so on. But I'll and, and give a glimpse of that and then move on to the main topic, which is looking at the fundamental alternatives. Um, so basically, very short on the violence of current models of development, um, looking at a range of, of uh, alternatives on the ground, particularly in India, which is what I'm more familiar with, but also a few in other parts of the world. Um, then look at what are the kind of larger conceptual frameworks uh, that are emerging from these constitutes initiatives. And uh, then some sort of key questions that uh, remain, and not, not, nobody has all the answers. So what are some of the crucial issues of the transformation that we want that need a much more discussion and dialogue and a little bit about a process that we're trying to do in India and proposing also more globally that could help us to take the transformations further. So quickly on the first one, um, I, I like using advertisements uh, because I think they kind of in the hidden messages or sometimes not so hidden messages in them uh, show us a great deal of what's happening. So this, this particular one is from about 25 years back in India, it's an Indian multinational corporation. And it's very interesting if you look at the text there, it says all over the world nature's mighty barriers separate oil, gas, minerals, and water from their destination. So first of all, nature as a barrier that sort of sets out what is the uh, thinking in, in development, especially economic uh, uh, sections of uh, decision making. And then it says only a handful of international giants can bridge these gaps, none of them is Indian. Dorsal, ripping through jungles in Indonesia, moving the earth in India, laying pipelines. Now, uh, it's very unlikely that any ad agency is going to put up an ad like this today, because they would know that it's politically extremely inappropriate. But the thinking behind development is still very much the same. Especially from India, we know this is exactly what still happens, where uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares of forests are being uprooted for mining, for dams, for highways, for all kinds of so-called development projects. But it's also interesting that development uh, is not just violence against nature, but also people. So this is an advertisement from the Ministry of Rural Development in India a few years back. Oops. Oh, this is a touch thing, huh? mm -hmm. I should not touch this. <laughs> Never used this before. So um, that's, it, it's interesting because if you look at it, uh, there's no link between the guy with uh, the rifle and rural development. But if you read again between the lines, uh, you can see that what happens in the name of development is in fact violence against communities because people's lands are used, people's forests are taken away, people's water is taken away, and they resist in many cases. And if they resist, then they're physically uh, thrown out, often with the use of armed police. Um, so in many senses, uh, development is is, uh, is a form of violence against people, against communities, against nature, and against each one of us individually also. So uh, what I characterize the move that you see towards um, the current forms of livelihood, jobs that we have, is, is a move from livelihoods, which were really not jobs, they were ways of working, which integrated culture, which integrated leisure, etc. You didn't have this hard divide between work and leisure, which we have now in modern society, where we desperately wait for the weekend uh, to enjoy ourselves, and the rest of the time we're groaning, and then 
one day comes you have to be kind of cloning when you get out of bed and so on and all you have to go back to work. Possibly not in an environment like this where you probably have fun during the week also. But most people in modern society are, are caught in this kind of thing. So I actually characterize this as and while the, the livelihoods, which were really livelihoods, are being destroyed uh, through the processes of the So I sort of think of that more as like process from livelihoods to deadlyhoods, which all of us, many of us are subject to. Uh, and then if you look at uh, uh, the violence that is created through increasing inequality. This is, of course, a global phenomenon. This is not just in Europe, with 42 people, only 50% of the world's wealth. Uh, and in India, the latest figure is from a week back, is that the 5% five, 5 of India's riches now um, uh, have something like 70% of its wealth. So it's, it's a growing inequality, which is what enables the world's largest single family house to be in a so called poor country. That's Mr. Ambani's uh, house, 27 stories for a family of five people. Um, even while, just under him, there are millions of people living with no decent accommodation at all. So there is this growing inequality, which is also caused by the same model of, of development. And then we're seeing increasingly in the last few years, especially in India or maybe everywhere in the world, that where people are dissenting, where they are raising their voice against these forms of violence in the name of development, uh, the state looks back. The state and corporations look back. Um, so, for instance, hard fought labor laws, environmental laws, spaces that people have created for citizens' action are being ushered. Um, laws are being diluted or just thrown out or bypassed. Um, and uh, there's increasing action. This car yesterday, two days back, five people in India have been arrested, their homes raided, uh, simply because they were dissenting. And in India, we have this whole phenomenon called Naxalism, or extreme left uh, groups who take to arms in Central India. So now it's become convenient for the government to label any of us who dissents as being an Axel, a Maoist, and then you can use any kind of law to do so, this is, uh, to my mind, a direct consequence of a globalized, globalized form of development, uh, economic growth as being the god of that, of that form of development. Anybody dissenting from it is seen to be uh, anti national, anti development, etc. Et um, so, I'm going to stop there. I mean, of course, this is a very simplistic view of what development and governance is, but uh, I just thought it would be a very quick glimpse of. Uh, the question then is, are there alternatives? And I think when we ask this question, uh, especially to sort of go beyond what, you know, what the market factor was, I think, who said the Tina syndrome, which is like, there is no alternative. This is the only way we have to do things, which is also what we hear from our uh, governments. Um, the question that arises is alternative to what? Uh, this is really important because I think uh, these days now the kind of buzz around environment and social issues and all of that, everybody is claiming to be in some ways eco-friendly. You know, the products in the, in the market that you see from biggest corporations now talk about being natural and, and uh, organic and blah, 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 all of that. Uh, or increasingly the government says we are, our development processes are inclusive. So we're actually trying to make sure that all poor people are also benefited from this uh, from this model. So when we say alternatives, we need to figure out what truly is uh, a fundamental alternative to the kind of problems that we that the system is creating. And so the way we try and look at it is to say these need to be, if there are initiatives at trying to solve the problems, they need to be not just simply things like okay, how do you recycle things better or, or how do you uh, simply move from uh, chemical to organic food. You need to actually go more deeper to look at the structures that have created the problems in the first place. And one can think of that in, in the form of, say, the concentration of power in the hands of capitalists, corporations, or in the hands of state, in state dominated regimes, or in the hands of men in, in patriarchy, or in the hands of certain castes in India, or racism, ethnicity. Uh, and species, which is human domination over the rest of the earth. So, in some way or the other, the 
the fact that power is used for oppression, for exploitation, for domination is at, at the root, structural root of the problems that we have. And so therefore we're trying to look at, if you're looking at alternatives, we're trying to see, okay, alternatives that kind of really challenge these fundamental structures and then try and find ways out of them and, and uh, an alternative way of, of, uh, uh, of structuring society. Um, and so this means also that we have to uh, really challenge the kind of solutions that the system is giving us, which to which in the analysis of many of us are somewhat superficial or sometimes even very really aggressive, like carbon trading or the CDM redevelopment mechanism or uh, uh, the techno fixes that many of these organizations are telling us, or even actually to my mind sustainable development. If you look at the Sustainable Development Goals agenda, the SDG agenda from 2015, it's got a lot of great stuff. Um, there's no doubt that it's a significant advance from the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. But it's still essentially based on economic growth um, as the way of driving people out of poverty and moving towards sustainability and so on, which to my mind is an inherent contradiction. And it's still extremely dependent on nation states and corporations to be driving this agenda. It doesn't truly actually, again, challenge the fundamental structures that I mentioned earlier. So to, to us, a number of these things are somewhat superficial. And again, we need to go beyond, beyond that. So how do we do that? Uh, how do we actually work towards more transformative, more systemic alternatives? That's uh, something that uh, a lot of us have been trying to look at. And in order to see that, try and find these answers, to get clues on how to do this, to my mind, the most important thing is to look at what people are doing on the ground. It's not really just at conferences and conceptual level that people let us look at, but actually on the grassroots, what is happening. So I'm going to go through uh, a few of these examples. But before I do that, I think it's also important to mention their resistance, where people are saying no to the system. Um, for instance, this particular demonstration that was held uh, 30 years back against uh, two big dams that were coming up in central India, where people said, we won't let our rivers be shackled by dams. For us, these rivers are sacred, and of course, they're crucial for our livelihoods, and we, uh, the dams are a violation of that. Uh, so this movement actually was successful. It stopped those dams from coming up. There's a whole lot of these all over the world, right? these kind of resistance movements. And they're very crucial, uh, partly because they kind of slow down the bulldozer of uh, mainstream capitalist uh, or state-led development, but also because they show us that there are other ways of looking at the world. That is, that the world of nature, for instance, is not to be looked at simply as a, as a source of exploitation. Um, the way our, our relationship with the earth is looked at is not just in terms of, okay, how do we exploit it more uh, the maximum, the maximum extent. Uh, and I think what, so this, this particular example, for instance, from India, where this indigenous tribe uh, challenged a proposed mining corporation from the UK, interestingly called Vedanta, uh, where uh, they said that the narrative that they gave was not just that these areas are crucial for our livelihoods, which of course is the case, but that that landscape does not even belong to us. So who are we to give permission? It belongs to Niam Raja, which is like the king of the of the mountain range, and go and ask him. You know, and of course, uh, the modern development paradigm has no way of actually dealing with an issue like that. Um, so it's a very different way of looking at the world, and I think these resistance movements are also helping us to kind of wake up and say that there are diverse worldviews which need to be taken into account in any process of. Um, but we also need processes by which people are not simply saying we want to be left alone, but also there are issues that need to be dealt with. There is hunger, there is uh, real poverty, there is deprivation, there are gender uh, uh, inequalities, there are caste inequalities, etc. So all of these things do need to be dealt with. So we have in the last few years been documenting cases around India of uh, various kinds of people uh, doing these transformative actions on the ground, as I said, in all these different fields. We have a website, which I'll show you later, um, which has now more than a thousand stories of things happening in these different sectors. 
Uh, and from, I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse of, of some of those. Before I do that, I also wanted to put up this image partly because I love doing this with students, I think most of you, of course, will be familiar with this. But uh, partly because I think it's a very decolonizing way of looking at the, at the world. So when I put this up with students, they say, but why is this upside down? And then of course I ask them, why is the, the map that we know today not upside down? If the world is round, there is no right side up to look at the world in a different way, right? And then uh, it's useful to remind ourselves that that map, which we think of as the normal one, is actually a colonial map with Europe right on top and England being shown. Now here you see that Europe becomes much smaller and England almost disappears. And that's the right side of the continents actually, which has been completely distorted in the so-called normal map that we have. So I love this map. But the other reason I put this up is also to just put up the thing that while my examples are mostly going to be from India, there's similar stuff happening across the world. Michelle is involved with a lot of agroecology stuff happening in different parts of the world. I'm sure some of you are involved with There's lot of other similar movements. Uh, and increasingly we're kind of learning across the world of the kinds of fundamental systemic transformative of alternatives that people are trying out with a great deal of difference but also a great deal of similarities. And I'll speak right at the end about the need for much greater contact and convergence amongst these different movements to be able to do more cross-sharing, more cross-learning, more collaboration, etc. Um, so Three or four examples from India. <clears throat> this is one that Michelle is extremely familiar with. I don't know whether you've spoken to your colleagues about it or not. Okay. Um, we have both been involved with this for a long, long time now. So we get here maybe. No? Yeah. So it's a very interesting initiative of uh, Dalit women farmers. You are familiar with the caste system in India? Um, so in the caste system, Dalits are the, the most oppressed section of Indian society. I think 200 million people, so it's not a small number. It's a very, 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 very large part of India's population. And have traditionally, in especially in Hindu society, been the most downtrodden, the most marginalized, the most exploited. And even now, uh, are still extremely marginalized. So they're Dalits, they're women, and in an extremely patriarchal society, which India is, again, they're marginalized because of that. And they're small farmers, uh, mostly like an acre or two acres of land. Maximum three acres of land. So, in a class structure, also they're at the margins. So, triple disprivileged in some senses. Now, from a situation of extreme food insecurity, uh, casteism, gender uh, oppression, etc., what they've done over the last few decades, and I'm, I'm trying to compress a 30 year story into a, into a couple of minutes so it be simplistic, is to collectivize themselves as uh, women's committees, sandhras as we call them there, to share their resources, especially with things like seeds and knowledge and credit and so on. Bring back a lot of the traditional varieties of seeds, uh, moving away from the modern ones which require pesticides and fertilizers, they kind of come back to old varieties of millets, especially millets, but also local varieties of rice and so on, pulses and so on. And, uh, uh, bring them back into cultivation uh, through these collective sharing kind of experiences. And also link this up to um, what's called the public distribution system in India, the PDS, which is the government system of being able to subsidize food grains for the poor. On paper, an extremely good system, but in actual practice, highly distorted, lots of corruption, very bad food grains that come into that system, etc. A lot of good food grains goes into the market. So here they, they created a parallel public distribution system of the locally grown organic healthy food which could be uh, taken up by poor people. Um, and so in some sense it's kind of also creating local consumer producer linkages, a small uh, restaurant in, in a nearby town with their own traditional recipes. So kind of creating a more of a localized economic loop around agriculture that they could be in control of and through that moving into what they call food sovereignty. So that's your center is called agroecology and water and food sovereignty? No. That's the MSC. That's the MSC, right? <laughs> okay. No. 
And in one of the few places in India where it's worked, I actually also arguing for land rights for women. Because most parts in most places in India, the land is in the name of men, not for women. And here the women have achieved that. Through that kind of transformation in agriculture and food, also then to move towards other aspects of life. So creating their own media center, making their own films, uh, running a community radio station, which goes to about 150 200 villages, um, and a whole lot of other things. I mean, I'm, as I said, the cuttings are almost very, very short. So what has, apart from the fact that they're food secure and so on, to my mind, I think what's the more, one of the most incredible transformations that's taken place there is is from the triple disprivilege that they had, is to actually be uh, able to gain much more respectful position in society. Um, moving, you know, at least reducing some of the casteism, reducing quite a bit of the gender discrimination, and gaining much more of a status, uh, a respectful social status, where earlier they were highly uh, marginalized, as I said. Um, the second example, which ran extremely well for about 10 12 years and then has become weak but has a lot of interesting lessons for us, is from Western India, a highly rain, um, highly low rainfall area, let's say, one of the worst rainfall areas in India, which of course water then becomes an extremely scarce resource, where uh, about 20 25 years back, a local organization helped about 65 villages in this particular river basin. To, to uh, do a series of cascading small scale stuff, water harvesting structures. So that's the technical part of it. But the one interesting part I found was that these 65 villages then formed a governance unit, which they call the People's Parliament, where they would meet every six months, representatives from every all of these villages would meet, to decide not just on issues of water sharing, which is really, of course, the core of, of their work, but so that the village right at the end, the end of the basin, river basin, could also get as much water as required and not everything was captured by the villages on upstream. But also other issues, law and order, uh, or other disputes between villages, the management of the catchment area, the conservation of forests, so a whole bunch of things that were uh, discussed and decided at this forum, the People's Parliament. And what they were showing us was, which I'll get back to them in a few minutes, is that you can think of decision-making units uh, in ecological ways. So they were doing this decision-making for the river basin, explicitly saying the basin is our decision-making unit, not the political divisions that we are otherwise subjected to. Third example, which is one of my favorites, is from Central India. This is an indigenous population, um, where about 30 years back, if you remember the image I showed you of the anti-dam movement across the river, this village was involved in that in that movement and subsequently it kind of decided that it's not just when an external threat comes that we should be getting together and doing things, we should also be uh, on a day-to-day -day basis looking at our own internal issues and you know how our own society works uh, and how we should be managing our resources and so on. One of the things for instance that came out during that, that movement was that women, even though it's an indigenous society which is much more equal in terms of gender, the women are not involved in the political decision of the community. Why should that be the case? Why should they be involved? So they decided around that time that they would form, reformulate the village assembly, what we call the Gram Sabha, in such a way that decisions would be taken by no chief, no government bureaucrat, nobody but the entire assembly by consensus. And that until the last person actually agreed, they would keep discussing. Nobody would be forced into a decision. Uh, that includes women, children, uh, women, men, and sometimes often the children also, as you can see here. So, but also they realized that they had a lot of local traditional knowledge to be able to take those decisions, but not necessarily all of it. And this is natural, right? So, because for instance, something like climate change is coming from outside, it's not as the local community will have all the knowledge of how to deal with it or how to even understand it. So, they formed these study circles. Uh, in which they, they uh, asked people to come in from outside also to bring their knowledge, NGOs, government officers, so that they could put their local traditional knowledge and outside knowledge together to be able to take more informed decisions. And then somebody came up with this slogan many years back saying, okay, the process we have now means that even as we elect the government in New Delhi and Mumbai, in our village, we are the government. 
nobody else but us make the decisions here. In 2013, after about 15 years of discussion, they also converted the entire private land into common land. Now, this is another very interesting part of the transformation of challenging uh, private property itself. So there is now not a single inch of private property in that region. Um, we see similar kinds of things happening across, across the world where people are asserting that government doesn't mean that only elections, but that we are uh, autonomous units and that decision making needs to happen by us, through us. Um, so, for instance, I, I don't know where it's worked, but I just read a few months back of this indigenous movement in Peru, the Wapi indigenous peoples, asserting their self governance and autonomy. And through that, refusing, for instance, permission to an oil company to do uh, its extraction in their, in their territory. Uh, this is one example of many that are happening across the world. The last example I'm going to give of, uh, of these sorts of move, moves uh, from India is, is the city. So this is a small city in Western India called Guj, where there's uh, some very interesting initiatives that are trying to create greater self-reliance within an urban context, uh, and especially amongst the poor people. In India, as you probably know, something like 35 to 40 percent of the urban population is living in slums, squatter settlements, very poor housing conditions, very poor environmental conditions, etc. So this has been, this has been a move to try and see how, in an extremely low rainfall and a very poor area, you can actually have complete water self-sufficiency by proper harvesting and management of water. You can have water uh, housing, mostly done using, as far as possible, local materials built by local people, not having to have these expensive architects and builders and so on. You can do greater energy self-sufficiency, so we're moving much more into decentralized energy sources. You can do uh, garbage and sanitation, etc., etc., all managed by the local people themselves. Um, um, and, and so, therefore, actually, truly implementing uh, one of the constitutional provisions in India, which is for urban self governance. So, the earlier one was rural self governance, which I showed you earlier, and now also urban self governance. Uh, trying to say that in cities, we should again be the center of decision making and not leave decision making only to so called urban experts and, and politicians and so on. Um, just a quick snapshot of stuff happening in other parts of the world, of people moving towards this kind of you know, the politics of, of local decision making, uh, more direct democracy, which uh, we, um, I know some of these examples, I don't know all of them, I'm sure you're familiar with other similar examples. Um, and similarly, economic transformations, I was, three, so a couple of years back, I was in Greece at a factory called Viome which uh, used to be run by a capitalist owner. He then, uh, when the 2008 crash happened, he kind of abandoned it and wanted to sell off all the machinery. The workers didn't allow him, and in fact now workers took over the factory and said, we will run it, and we will run it on completely democratic principles. So they have this big slogan on the factory saying, we have no boss. Uh, and it's run on like, there's 30 workers, they all work democratically. Every one of them is paid exactly the same for every hour of work, regardless of what they're doing, etc. So there's some amazing stuff like that, which is also happening in different parts of the world. Um, Helsinki, for instance, uh, in Finland, used to have a very interesting time banking system. UK has, what is this called, the Spice Network or something, where 30,000 people are registered for sharing their time. And service is free of cost. So no monetary transaction. You say, okay, for five hours a week, I will give free yoga lessons or physics tuition or whatever I'm good at, you know, gardening or electrical plumbing or whatever. And uh, that kind of stuff uh, in Helsinki, for instance, several thousand people also had signed up for something like that. Uh, where what's I think really crucial about that is not just the fact that there's no monetary transaction. Uh, but that every piece of work is valued the same for every other piece of work. Which really challenges the hierarchies that we build up saying, okay, those who are doing intellectual work get greater pay than those who are doing manual work. Okay, the people who are writing about food get more income than the people who are producing food, farmers. 
So that kind of hierarchy has built up an assistant that's challenged and through these sorts of alternative economics also. Um, it's really crucial also to look at how um, people who are entering the system through formal schooling and college, what kind of ideas that they're coming with. Uh, you will be facing that all the time when you're dealing with students is that you're actually, most of the schooling system, at least I learned from India, is meant to deliver uh, students into the system in ways that they can neatly fit into the boxes that we have set up for them. And some go to corporate, some go to government, etc. Nobody, very few actually challenge the system. Um, so we have now in India a number of examples and across the world, of course, a number of examples of a, of a different learning environment, of a different education or different education system, which challenges this, which says the, the kids that are coming out of this need to be people who are uh, who, who can question, who have the ability to question, the ability to think for themselves, the um, capacity to be responsible uh, adults, not selfish, but you know, people who, who can empathize with what's happening to the other person, um, and who learn not just through their heads, but also hands and heart. So Gandhi's old formula, what we call the new, 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 new way of learning was put hands, heart and head together. Whereas most of our learning in our schools, at least in India, is just here. It's like cram stuff into your head and then pass the exams and then go out and make money. So uh, there's examples across the world. This is for instance the same uh, record development society, women, Dalit women, they run a school where a lot of the teaching happens outdoors. So for instance, that's an exercise where the children are actually making sugar cane juice and learning physics and chemistry through that process. This is a school in uh, uh, in extreme northern uh, India, close to the Tibet border, where uh, the entire school was built by the students and the faculty. And it's built with passive solar architecture, so that even when it's minus 40 degrees outside, you can be sitting inside and sleeping inside through the night with no artificial heating. Uh, and through the fact that they were they participated really built it, they actually learned physics and chemistry and architecture and uh, physical properties of wood and all kinds of stuff. So there's a whole lot of these very interesting ways of trying to to to, to transform learning uh, uh, environments uh, so that people can actually come out to be real human beings and not just cogs in the system. And that brings me to uh, this. My, one of my favorite things is to look at the original meaning of words. So, democracy, power of the people, not power of elected representatives. School originally meant learning by leisure. <laughs> In India, schools are as far away from that as you can think of. <laughs> there are more prisons than anything else. Um, yeah. And finally, then of course, uh, um, science and technology or, or knowledge, uh, the fact that there are different knowledge systems, the fact that actually each one of us can be a producer and is a producer of knowledge. Again, it's just privileged in the mainstream system where you think of knowledge as being produced only in so called expert institutions. Uh, so, again, many examples of this. I already gave you an example of the school, Secmol. This is a very interesting issue, uh, completely the other end of the temperature spectrum, so that it's plus 45 degrees here in Western India and Dutch. In this, the way they make this using traditional and new architecture, okay, you can sit inside uh, without even a fan sometimes, forget about air condition. Whereas in fact in mainstream society we are now seeing that even in the most, even in places where it only goes up to 30 degrees, people are beginning to use air conditioners in India. It's just stupidity in um, and the media, so uh, across the world, again, the media is captured by corporations or the state or both. And same thing is happening in India, so there's this whole movement towards alternative media where people can actually try and get across to people, get across their messages. Like community radio stations that I mentioned earlier, there's now more than 100 community radio stations in India, some working very well, some not, but providing the possibility of, of people being able to. Uh, have democratic control over media. So again, just a few examples of that. 
uh, some of them using traditional folk media like theater and so on, music, etc. Some even new ones like radio using mobile phones, etc. So um, let me then move into looking at um, from these and many many other examples that we have. Uh, are we are we finding some common elements of a framework of alternatives? And uh, what one of the things we've done working with these communities and initiatives is to say what are the key principles emerging from what you're doing? Yeah. Some of them articulate themselves. Sometimes we have to sit with them to articulate because they're you know they're hundred percent busy with what they're doing, so it's not as if they have the time to actually do this kind of thing. We we work with them to do it. And we find that there's five different spheres um, in which this kind of work happens. So I already mentioned direct, direct, direct democracy is a kind of examples from Central India. Um, economic democracy in terms of people trying to regain like the reowning factory with workers gaining control over the means of production and the product. Um, Issues of social justice or Dalits or women fighting for greater equality. Um, knowledge democracy, where you're trying to put together different forms of knowledge to create the solutions you want, whether it's with water or energy or housing. And then, of course, all of this is based on a respect for, for the man, because, of course, unless the earth is protected, we're all dead. Um, so, let me just quickly, and then at the core of that, which I will come to in a few minutes, is a set of basic ethical values that again emerge from a number of these examples. So I'm going to go quickly into each one of these. The first one is uh, is democracy. Reminding ourselves, as I just mentioned, that democracy means power of the people, not power delegated to others. Uh, and so therefore, at the root of this new politics would be direct or radical democracy. Wherever we are, as collectors, whether it's this institution, or it's a village community, or it's an urban neighborhood, or whatever, we are the ones who are at the center of this issue. That doesn't mean we're the only ones, but we have to be very much a part of that. And this can happen in very local, it has to happen in very local face-to-face -face conditions, but it can also happen at larger levels of things like referendums. And of course, referendums can go horribly wrong. I guess I don't need to point this out in this question. Um, but, uh, uh, and I'll come to at the end of this to actually talk about what what are sort of some of the preconditions that would be needed even for a direct democracy model to work. You still need to have larger level decision making processes happening. And so one is not saying that representative democracy is completely out of the picture, you still need to like the whole UK or whatever regions you think of still, or for instance that parliament people's parliament, it's a larger level where face-to-face -face meeting cannot happen. So you need to have delegated or representative democracy. The question is how does one make that accountable to the units of direct democracy. So again, there's many different experiments around the world uh, of right to recall, of public audits, of having to report back, of the possibility of removing your delegate if they're not functioning the way you want, etc. Which by which people or right to information, by which uh, governments or, or not governments, sorry, Institutions at that level can be made more comfortable. Uh, and the third very interesting, a fourth very interesting thing out of this is the, again, taking from the example of the River Valley Parliament, is how does one reimagine political boundaries using ecological and cultural uh, linkages, of course. And this would then mean uh, even questioning nation state boundaries in many parts of the world, especially where nation state boundaries are real accidents of history or creations of colonial power like Africa. You know, few people sat on a table and just made those political boundaries dividing up uh, parts of Africa. Or South Asia where um, contiguous ecosystems and cultural uh, communities have been cut by national boundaries between Bangladesh and India, India and Pakistan, India and China, etc. So again, beginning to kind of reimagine those not an easy task, and sometimes we get charged as being anti-national when you do that. But I think very, very important if you want to think of uh, ecology and, and culture as being at the core of decision making. Um, none of this is going to work unless we have these four things also happening at the same time 
through trial and error. Um, the rights to participate, I don't know if there's, if there's any country in the world which actually has a fundamental right to political participation. We have some kinds of rights. We have the right to information, we have the we have rights to participate in some local decisions, etc. We have the right to elections, but not really a fundamental right to participation in all decisions affecting others. That is one thing we need. Second, then capacity. Uh, at least in India for the last 200 years, we've been told that you know you sit back, the government will do it for you. We've actually lost our capacity to be part of decision making. Or have been systematically disinvested from it for, as, we, as women or as Dalits or as people who actually were told never to be part of, did not be part of the decision making process. So, how does one build that capacity amongst all of us? The third one, having forums. Do we have the assemblies where we can actually participate? Um, do we have referendums? Uh, do we have other processes in which this kind of participation? The fourth, I think, is the most important, which is the Wisdom of the maturity to be part of decision making in ways that are responsible towards others. And I will bring here in a minute the notion of Swaraj, which we talk about in India, where uh, Swaraj is not just about autonomy and freedom, but also responsibility towards other people. And so, this whole thing of majority versus minority, or you know, Brexit or no Brexit kind of thing, you have to be happy. And this is a long term process. We have to build the the possibility in each one of us to figure out that the decision that we take is not just for us, but also how is it going to impact somebody else. Um, second sphere is the new economics, which is looking at uh, how do we change the, the both the micro and the macro economics of where we are today. Um, so, examples that I've given you are about localizing the economy, at least as far as basic needs are concerned. So you're not dependent on somebody a thousand kilometers away for your water and your food and so on. Every part of the world you can at least have basics being met within a certain small region. Um, and then also producers, uh, production and consumption being in the, in the hands of producers and consumers. I mean, as consumers, when we go to the market, how much do we really know about the products that we, that we buy? That we consume or the food that we eat. Very little. Most of us don't even understand the ingredients that are written on the packets. A lot of it is deep. Uh, so, uh, how do we bring that kind of uh, control back in our lives over our production, production systems? Or, um, as I mentioned, this division between leisure and work. How do we actually recreate livelihoods that are enjoyable so that the sharp division is not there? Um, the recombining of private property, obviously one of the most difficult things across the world. But again, possibly crucial to see how land and other resources can, and ideas and knowledge can again be part of the commons. And then um, removing the kind of domination that centralized money systems have on our lives through time banking, through local currencies, through reforming the monetary system, the banking system, democratizing the banks, and so on. Third one is justice. I don't think I need to go into any great detail, but basically the kinds of uh, inequalities and, and hierarchies that we've had traditionally or new ones, uh, struggles against them. Again, the examples are given you know, the women's partners or others, uh, where they have been able to transform that situation is, uh, is the third major element of this transformation. The fourth is um, multiple cultures and knowledge systems. India, for instance, has 800 living languages. Each of those living languages is a library of knowledge. And as the state system says, okay, everybody has the right to education and everybody needs to be in school, that's fine, that's good. But then if the teaching in the school is just some mainstream languages, you're actually displacing and eroding enormous knowledge systems which are the local languages. That are there. The same thing with knowledge. When you say modern science and technology is the only relevant form of knowledge, then you're eroding enormous forms of other kinds of knowledge. So the respect for the diversity of cultures, knowledges, the decolonization of the mind with that map that being a very small example of that kind of decolonizing, um, the uh, replacing uh, knowledge and, and research and development and science and technology in the democratic common public domain, 
and uh, putting media and arts again as part of the commons rather than being captured by corporations or state or any. Like art also now is becoming so much a commodity, right? So the artist that will recognize it are the ones that get a million dollars for a painting or whatever. Whereas in fact, art is just a part of our, should be a part of our daily life. Each one of us can be, and is an artist in many forms. And then of course, opportunities for us individually to grow in terms of our own understanding, our, the deepening ourselves, the spiritual. I'm not talking about mainstream religion, I'm just talking about ethics and, and, and spiritualism within ourselves. Um, fifth element, resilience for nature, respecting uh, ecological the kind of units that we have. I think something I don't need to go into, but that's very interesting just to be put up there. Uh, movement across the world that uh, some of us are part of for the ICCS, which is really people trying to reassert their territorial uh, rights and the ability to conserve, protect, and manage ecosystems through customary or new means for using people's institutions. So, this is now a global network of more than 100 such movements and organizations. Right, so finally, then uh, putting all of this together all these different ingredients into the Indian dish that's emerging. Uh, we call it eco or in English, equivalent uh, radical ecological democracy. It's a very simple concept. Uh, essentially to say that wherever people are, oh yeah, sorry, going back to words. The word radical has been extremely misused, especially in the Indian context. So if you have an extremist religious person, you call them radical. Uh, you know, youth are getting radicalized, they're becoming extremists in their ways. There's such a bad use of the word because radicalism means going to the roots. And in fact, if we were radicalized, we'd, we'd be good because we'd be going back to our culture and ecological roots. Um, so, this, this concept simply means that wherever we are as citizens, we are part of decision making processes. But as we assert our decision making rights, we are also responsible to the earth and to each other. As so, it brings in justice and sustainability. But this also means that, that the locus of decision making is that collective. It's not the government as it is right now, it's not the corporation, it's us as wherever we are in our collectives and communities. This quickly what is Swaraj, uh, this is the term that became very popular with Gandhi in the independence movement in India, but it actually is a much older concept, which like I mentioned earlier is about my autonomy or my community's autonomy uh, but with responsibility towards your mind and your community. So, which means that you're building in restraints in behavior, in resource consumption, etc., etc. You're looking within yourself and outside, you're building solidarity relationships, etc. Uh, it's not just about India being independent of UK. Um, and there's similar worries around the world. Um, from South America, Michelle will be more familiar with this than I am. So many of the indigenous concepts are coming back as part of movements where they're saying living well is not about modern or material consumption. It's about living responsibly with the earth and with each other. Very similar to Swaraj or Ubuntu in South Africa, which most people, most young people in India know it as a software. But actually the old Southern African concept which says I am because we are. Not I am because I think, obviously, I think that, therefore I am, whatever the Western thing was. But it's really about saying I exist only because there is a collective. And the collective includes other species. And similar things happening in, in even in the industrialized world, pro feminism, degrowth in Europe, etc. Et so, this is my most important slide to me, which is that. There's no way to replicate a tech and development society from there to another part of the world. Or, or a Biome factory from Greece to a factory in India. But what can be learned and replicated is the basic principles. So a lot of our work is just to actually help people to articulate these basic principles of what they're trying to do. What are the what's the ethics that is underlying the work they do? I'm just putting up a bunch of them here. Um, if parts of the world, different terms are used, etc. But I find that, at least in the work I do with other movements around the world, is that there is some amount of basic threads that you can draw, even amongst the whole diversity of difference, which is really about these values. It's about, for instance, 
cooperation uh, and not competitiveness. It's about collective and not individual selfishness. It's about respecting all life forms, not just humans at the center of the earth, and so on. There's a whole lot of these which I think are very common, but could be expressed in many different ways. And some may not be common also, there might be differences. The crucial thing is how do we put these movements together to, to do this kind of learning much more and build those threads much more strongly. That last bit was added by the way we had a youth conference on this and all these issues. And this is all spread, but it's too serious. So please add fun as a well, fundamental value. <laughs> fundamental. Uh, so of course lots of questions remain. Um, so all of this, so for instance, uh, you know, if we're talking about this kind of transformation, who is the catalyst for it? Uh, in different parts of the world, it would be different. But clearly, I don't think political parties are going to be catalysts. So uh, I don't think NGOs per se in the way that we are. Uh, I think it's going to be people's movements. But then, what kind of people's movements and in, in, in what form? Um, what would be the role of the state? Uh, do we still need governments in the long run, or are we talking about stateless societies? Um, what would be the nature of global governance? The United Nations seems to be more and more failing us in whatever its tasks were. So what is a different form of global governance that would encompass these principles? Mm -hmm. um, would there still be a private business sector? Or would it be a social business sector? If so what forms would it take? Is there a role at all for any corporations anymore? I personally don't think so. But these are questions that I think need to be asked and, and discussed. Um, and for universities, how do we rethink our own knowledge systems? So we, we talk about transdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary, but how much do we actually do it? How much is it possible? And how much is it possible to, for instance, in India, I've been challenging universities to call people from villages as faculty members. You know, like a, a woman from the Development Society uh, who's, who can rattle off 30 varieties of species of crops should come in and teach in an agricultural university or somewhere else. So, uh, this kind of breaking those sorts of walls that we built also becomes part of it. So, how do we do it? And of course, how then does so? It's all lots of very scattered, fantastic movements and initiatives around the world. How do we kind of use a critical mass to affect the macro changes? So, in the end, just to mention a, a process with Nordic, which tries to bring together people to do this at least at the level of India, is called Vikalp Sangha, which means alternative confluence. People working on each of these different sectors of life, trying to bring them together to learn, to cross fertilize, to build further collaborations, to uh, dream together. So, we've had about 14 such confluences in different parts of the country, regionally or thematic levels. This process will continue over the next few years. Um, and it's an incredible space, you know, those three, four days of meeting together uh, where we discuss the team, but also a lot of sharing of positive stuff. It's like a really great energy booster. Uh, and then you go back home and then kind of try and take our work further based on that. And also do uh, collective vision. So this book is partly a result of that. Where we said um, in our day to day life, we often don't have the luxury of, uh, of the day dreaming, but we're told not to day dream. can't sort of sit back and just stare at the ceiling anymore. Uh, so we actually got 40 people to say, Look, we're giving you the opportunity to do that. And dream India for 2100 of what kind of vision you want. Um, and be completely out of the box, totally unrealistic and impractical, etc. etc. Do that, but then come back down to earth and say, okay, what's the current context? What are the current initiatives already existing which can uh, point to it and then shows the pathways of getting to that dream future. So it's quite an interesting set of essays, uh, many of them trying to talk to each other also on all kinds of different themes. So we have arts and media, we have gender and sexualities, we have democracy, education, health, uh, villages and cities, languages, culture, Conservation, transportation, Sadhavasi, indigenous people, food, water, energy. So it's an attempt, it's a kind of experimental attempt trying to do something which goes beyond our normal mundane day to day life. 
We also have a tool that we developed, uh, which I'll share with you, um, which is trying to, which is a, which is enabling uh, these initiatives to do self-assessment of the kind of transformation that they're attempting. So, for instance, if I am working on, let's say, uh, grassroots level conservation of a forest, and I'm doing that very well, am I also mindful of the social justice angles to it? Or am I inadvertently actually uh, uh, dispossessing some landless people who are dependent on that forest? Uh, am I still basically doing decisions through men and excluding women? So looking at the cultural, social, political, ecological, economic angles together to do self-assessments to try and figure out. We do that even as institutions. So we use it for my organization, for Balkovich, to see internally how democratic. We say we talk about democracy outside. But internally, our democratic army, how diverse are we? How ecologically sensitive is our own office, for instance? So, this is a very interesting thing which uh, we're trying to get others also to, to use. Uh, and finally, then uh, we've also put together a book, uh, a more global one, which is coming out in November, which has 110 brief essays on radical alternatives around the world. So, uh, I have some flyers of this here, which you're welcome to pick up. I also have a publication which has um, got lots of examples of things happening in India along with the framework that I presented. It's got some nice pictures. Also. So, welcome to pick up copies of that. And um, therefore, based on all of this, we are proposing a global alternative forum. Try to get a lot of these different movements together. The discussion on this has just started last week at the Degrowth Conference. And uh, have a reach out to share about it, and if there is interest, we can think of how, uh, you know, is this feasible at all? Do you want to do it? If so, how can it be done? What is its relationship with existing global forums like the World Social Forum and others? These are all things that are part of discussion right now. Oh, this is something we've quoted in this book. There's a lot of people. After listening to this presentation, say, I ah, that's nice, but it's utopian. It's, not, it, it's impossible. No one needs that kind of a radical ecological democracy. Um, and so I love this quote. It says, uh, Utopia is on the horizon. I move two steps further, move two steps further, walk another 10 steps, and Utopia runs 10 steps further away. As much as I may walk, I never reach it. So what's the point? The point is this it makes us continuously advance. We have a vision towards which reach and in my mind utopian thinking therefore is very very social government.